This show is brought to you by Interesting Radio. You can find all our shows over at interestingradio.nz. We're born with a natural curiosity, and we have an open mind. We want to learn things. We want to learn how to... And I am not a visionary. I do not have a five-year plan. I'm an engineer, and I think it... Let's plug it in. It's going to say, hey, I see you plugged in a new device, and it's going to load in the appropriate drivers. You'll notice that this scanner build... Whoa. Well, hello. Welcome to Tech Explainers. Uh, you're with Mike and Dan this time. How are you, Dan? Yeah. I'm on the wrong side of the desk. Is it uh, scary for you? It's interesting. I'm not used to being in the guest seat. <laughs> Excellent. I've got lots of buttons to push over here. I'll see if I can make a real mess of it, shall I? Oh, no. <laughs> All right, so this is episode uh, two, we'll call it. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about uh, GPS today. And uh, I'm on this side because um, I've been playing with it probably a bit more than Dan has, so I thought I'd have a go at explaining it. Yeah. So sounds pretty good. Um, what do you think? Next time we had uh, an idea of something about power, maybe? I know we've got a guest we lined up there. That's just a teaser for next time, so anyway... Let's talk about some GPS. Dan can cut that out later if he likes. <laughs> so starting with some history. Um, do you know much about it, Dan? Not a lot about the history, no. Well, it's actually pretty cool. Um, the, the the real first time that GPS was thought about, and, and the, the predecessors anyway, was back when Russia launched Sputnik. And a couple of American physicists decided that they wanted to monitor its radio transmissions. And they realized really quickly that the radio transmissions had Doppler effect on them. Do you know what Doppler effect is? Yeah. Do you want to explain it? <laughs> I feel the need to explain it with a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could, we'll, we'll put in post-production here, we'll, we'll cut in a, a fire engine. So everybody's probably heard of a fire engine going past, right? And you've got that nice highest pitched noise and it goes past, it goes really low. I've I've, seen, I've actually heard of people that actually think they do that intentionally for people they're going past. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, once they have a Doppler effect explained, anyway. So what's happening there, folks, is you um, as the as the fire engine is coming towards you, the sound that it's producing is coming towards you at the speed of sound plus the speed of the vehicle. So it sounds a little bit more compressed. You can imagine those sound waves getting to you just a little fraction earlier. Yeah, so it sounds a bit higher pitched, and as it goes past you. It would sound, in quotes, normal because as it's coming off the side of the vehicle towards you, there is actually no vehicle speed being added. That is the speed of sound. That's what the siren actually sounds like when the vehicle stopped. Mm. And as it goes away from you, you are hearing the sound at the speed of sound, less the speed of the vehicle because mm, it's going away yeah. from you. So, of course, it expands those waves out and it sounds like a lower sound. So that's Doppler effect. Same thing happens with radio and same things happens with the radio signal from Sputnik. And that's what these uh, physicists... Uh, Recognised in the signal from Sputnik. That was back in 1957. Hmm. Way back then. And since then, um, they uh, came out with a few technologies as transit, Amiga, Timation, all these things. They're basically a a, a, uh, a radio form of location information. Basically kind of how GPS works, but with older technology and older satellites and bits and pieces. Then uh, coming up to 1973, um, the... There was a big meeting with the American military and government and things at the Pentagon, and they came up with this thing called the Defense Navigation Satellite System, which is DNSS. It's pretty close to GPS, but it's not quite there. And then that was the predecessor. That's what turned into GPS. And they actually had that system operating for the military quite early on. Um, then a little bit further on, 1983, President Reagan made a available for the public, which was pretty cool. And they did that because... Uh, a Boeing 747, Korean Airlines Flight 007, oh, <laughs> <Dead one. laughs> uh, carrying 269 people, was shot down after straying into the USSR's restricted airspace. So, hmm. of course, let's use it for navigation, and I think that was the idea there. So the, that was uh, probably a, a decent idea, and, and as you can see, it's come along since then. Um so it's been publicly available since then, but with a lot of error. You ne never used to actually be able to get the accuracy you can get now. Have, yeah. you, have you heard of the thing? There's a thing called selective availability, which used to exist in it. Very clever. The American military basically had the ability to, to fix this 
selective availability signal, which was coming down, and actually they got the accurate stuff. Yeah. But Joe Public couldn't, and that's, uh, you know, I think the accuracy back then was 50 to 100 metres or something, so it's oh, quite a long way. Yeah. You wouldn't, <laughs> definitely wouldn't use that to drive your car around. No, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be in two streets over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, but anyway, so um, in May 1st, 2000, President Bill Clinton actually uh, signed away into legislation to turn selective availability off. So then the accuracy from the GPS was almost as accurate as you could get it as the military. They had some extra tricks up their sleeve, but... That's actually pretty recent. It is pretty recent. And uh, some enthusiasts, I, I'm hoping maybe one listener that might 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 start listening will, will go, oh, I know that date. That's the date that geocaching started. Right. And uh, the reason for that, if anyone's not heard of geocaching, hide a box post the coordinates on a website, go find the box. Other people go find them and, you know, trinkets and logbooks and things like that. Great fun to get out and walking around and doing things. But um, what are you... <laughs> you're, you're clicking the pen and it's coming through on the recording. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll put the pen down. You can cut that out. <laughs> yeah, so geocaching, of course, because the selective availability was turned off, the accuracy was high enough that people actually could find these boxes and they didn't have to search a 100-metre radius circle to find it. They could search a 2- or 3-metre radius circle depending on your accuracy of your GPS receiver, which is pretty cool. Has the technology improved since then as well? Because I remember going geocaching in uh, 2004. Yeah, absolutely. And yes. we spent probably two hours searching for a cache and we didn't find it. And I went back maybe five years later and the GPS took me somewhere completely different and I found it in a few minutes. Yeah, so the biggest thing that's changed is the receivers, so the, the right. things you can buy. Like yeah. The very first versions that you get back in the early uh probably the early 90s, which, you know, obviously had a selective availability on them, so you had bad accuracy anyway. Mm. They only received one or two channels. Right. And I'll get into this later, but going on how the satellites work. But that means they could only receive one or two satellites at a time, and it took them a very long time to get the information they needed to get a location. Mm. And combination yeah. of that plus the processing power and other things. Like that. Actually, that, that's quite interesting. Um, one of the most common GPS receivers way back in the day, was called a GPS-12 from Garmin. Yeah. It ran a 386 inside it, so there you go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you open up, and there's literally an Intel 386 chip in the back of it. Anyway, so um, you have a GPS receiver, which has improved. It's got a lot more channels, so it can receive a lot more satellites at once, but it also can receive a lot more GPS signals from different GPS systems because it's actually more than just GPS, if you didn't already know that. You get past selective availability and we get to where we are now. So we've got cars that can navigate and auto drive with our Teslas and, and uh, Google cars and you know, all those sorts of things and um, fantastic location with you know, your, your phone and you can work out where you are. You can play Ingress and all these things that people may have heard of. And Pokemon Go, did you play that, Dan? Yeah, not so much though. No, uh, it wasn't that much fun. In the first couple of weeks, it was kind of interesting because you know, everyone was everyone was out, so you'd like walk around the streets and there'd be you know oh, it fifty, hundred people I, there. It's yeah. like whoa. <laughs> yes, I remember that actually went out um, on an ingress trip with some guys. I, I actually, I lie. I haven't actually played it at all because I just refuse. It seems like a terrible idea. I never got into Pokemon. Did you as a kid? No, not really. No, it wasn't my thing. I was well, I'm a bit too old for it, I guess. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so now you've got um, planes that are using GPS for navigation and mm. um, you know, with the, uh, the huge numbers of uses for, for GPS now. And so how does it work? Do you know? Do you have any idea? I know that it uses all the satellites to kind of work out the difference in where it is in the sky and where you are and kind of... Yeah, well, so, essentially that's what it is. Um, the term triangulation is used, which is actually the wrong term. It's not triangulation at all. Triangulation is all about angles and, and taking measurements to work out where things are based on angles. Right. This is not. GPS is actually based on um, effectively relativity with speed of light. Hmm. So the signal coming from the, the GPS satellites, they all transmit a signal at all times, and this signal is received by your receiver and it uses a bundle of tricks to work out how far away that satellite is. So your receiver needs to know two things. Mm -hmm. It needs to know um, the time and it needs to know the uh, the position of the satellites. And it knows these things. We'll get on to it later on how it knows the position of satellites, which is actually quite clever in itself, and how it knows the time. So the 
the satellites themselves have very precise atomic clocks in them. So mm. they have the time absolutely perfect, but not quite. Because they're up there in the sky and they're traveling so much f- further and faster and outside the, or higher than we are, and outside, further outside the, the gravity well of gravity. planet Earth. Yeah, it changes how then, fast time travels. Correct. So the theory of relativity comes into play here. So the clocks actually drift. And if you do the maths and work it out, at the end of a day, you'll actually have an error in the GPS system. I think it's sort of like 10 kilometers. So if they didn't fix the time in it, wow. your, your error and position would get progressively worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So it's, it's fascinating. Is a long way. <laughs> it's a long way, yeah. So they're, they're actually correcting the time on these satellites relatively re- regularly. So, and, and that, that solves that problem. And they correct it from a time source on the ground? Correct. So there's more atomic clocks on the ground and they're yeah. almost adjusted. So, And, of course, atomic clocks, everyone thinks, oh, God, nuclear. It's actually not nothing to do with nuclear at all. It's all about the atom. And a given atom has a given half-life and that half-life is quite precise because mm. that's the property of that atom. So that's how they do the clock and the time out of the satellite. So then that gets transmitted down to Earth. So along with the time, um, it transmits what's called a pseudo-random code. It's, it's, you know, random characters and bits and pieces. But your receiver knows that as well. So what it does is it takes what it's receiving from the satellite, that code, mm. and the one that it knows, it says, well, I should be receiving, you know, 10101, and I'm receiving 10101, so that's cool, it's the right one. Ah, but the time's wrong, it's received at the wrong time. So by shifting it, and in time and delaying its own copy of of the code, it can work out how far away the satellite is based on how long it took the signal to get there. Right. And you repeat that three times with three different satellites and you get three different distances and things like that. And uh, using those three satellites as a minimum, you can get a location on the planet Earth, which is pretty cool. And then you need a fourth satellite as well, which is all complicated to do with how you have to get that precise time. Because, of course, you're... Your receiver itself isn't an atomic clock, but it still needs to have an accurate time. So it uses a trick with what's coming from the satellites to actually generate that time internally. So doing this means that you can have a very cheap GPS receiver that's mm. built into your phone or into your car yeah. rather than a really expensive GPS receiver with its own atomic clock. So the the, the way the system works is very clever in that you don't have to spend a lot of money on the ground station gear. It's the satellites, the ones that are obviously very expensive. <laughs> yeah. So that that's roughly how it works. I and mean, some people uh, have had described or um, the idea of three spheres. So if you take the distance that you knew, know you are from a satellite, mm. and then you draw a line from that satellite out as far as that distance, and then turn that into the radius of a sphere around that satellite, and then if you take three of those satellites and put them together, those spheres will intersect. Yeah. So, of course, you're at one of those intersection points. But if you do the maths and work it out, and, and draw it even as well, it can actually get quite complicated. If you if you are, only have two satellites, well, sorry, if I go back one more step, you've only got one satellite, you're somewhere on that sphere. Mm. You don't know where you are. But if you take two satellites, and you've got those spheres, and they intersect, you're somewhere on the circle where those two spheres intersect. So if you, you know, at home, if you've got a couple of squishy, you know, um, stress balls and sort of squish them together you'll see that it sort of makes a circle around where they touch each other that's mm. that's but you'll be somewhere on that circle get another satellite and another sphere around that satellite and then push it into the other side you actually could have been on the top of the bottom where those three spheres intersect it, it it's not actually how it works but it's a good way to explain it using spheres to sort of say you've got these distances from these satellites so you need that fourth one to actually finally get the position but it's, it's quite, right. there's lots of reading you can do to work out exactly how this works, and it's very clever. Yeah, um, so how do you know where in, on Earth to put the spheres? Because that then, gives they're you... They're not on Earth. They're on the, they're on the set. Oh, you mean the position of the satellite? Yeah. Because how, how, ah. if the GPS knows, okay, so I have this distance from three satellites, how does it know what that distance is in relation to to put itself on the Earth? I think I understand what you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I do. Basically, I think what you're asking is how does the receiver know where the satellite is to know where to draw itself on the yeah. Earth? Yeah. Right. So that signal that's coming from the satellite 
isn't just a random code and a time. It interspersed in with that random code, there is some extra data. It's dynamic data that changes all the time. And it's called, there's two parts to it. There's one that's called the Almanac, which basically has a, a big listing of all the satellites. Right. And there's one called the Ephemeris. And the Ephemeris is the information about what the satellite's path is and where it's going and its orbit and the characteristics of its orbit, how high it is, how fast it's going, its latitude, longitude, all those sorts of things are encoded in what's called the Ephemeris. Right, so there's the, the Almanac and um, and the Ephemeris. Now, this information is actually built up over time. It, it takes quite a while for these satellites to send it. They've got a ridiculously small bit rate for getting that data out. It's, hmm. um, I think it's, it's like 50 bytes, uh, sorry, 50 bits a second. Wow. So it's really slow. Yeah. And with the size of the Almanac and the Ephemeris, uh, it takes 12 and a half minutes to send a whole lot. Hmm. So, and this actually, in, it, this is why some people go, wow, oh, get a fix, get a fix, hurry up. It's because what's happened if your GPS receiver hasn't been on for long enough, like recently, hmm. then it's got to get all that stuff again and actually yeah. wait for it to come down so it can actually get an idea of where the satellites are and what they're things and signals are and it takes time so that's where you go if some people may have heard the term cold start or a yeah. hot start or things like that so there's a there's a cult from a uh, fix from cold start on a gps is when you start at the gps chip for the first time it's got no clue where it is or where anything is and it has to sit and listen for 12 and a half minutes at least to actually get a detailed mm. picture of what the sky is supposed to look like in terms of gps satellites so this information is um, so the ephemeris information for a given satellite is is the, is the detailed information about an orbit, and that information is actually updated every two hours by the central management system, how it all works, and things like that. And that information is only valid for four hours, right. so it's got a track, a very detailed track of exactly where the given satellite is for four hours hmm. and it's updated every two. So there's a bit of overlap there. And it has provisions for updates every six hours or longer in non-normal conditions. So, you know, you can have it dealing with, you know, issues with the base stations because, you know, th these satellites aren't, aren't as autonomous. There's um, base stations, I'm not sure where they are, but around the world that actually transmit information back up to them and command them, you know, adjust that time that needs to be adjusted and update their information about where they're flying. So the almanac, which is the information about what satellites there are, and what frequency, and where they roughly should be, not mm. the detailed information, that's uh, updated every 24 hours. But data for a few weeks um, is actually also there, so that if you don't turn your receiver on for a few weeks, you usually have something which gives you a rough idea, and the fix is faster. Right. So if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So when you're really lucky, and you turn your receiver on for the first time, or, you know, I don't. Do you do you leave your location information on on your phone all the time? Yeah. Yeah. So do I. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't understand the people are like turning it off all the time. It's like I think it's one of the reasons was saving battery. So it's like if I'm turning a feature off on a smartphone that gives me, you know, this is the reason I've got a smartphone. Why am I turning on and off all the time? You know, back in the early days of data, people were turning their data off every, you know, and only turn it on to receive that one web page. It's like no, it's a smartphone. It's supposed to have data yeah, all exactly. the time, but. <laughs> the, I guess it's just differences of people's opinions on how that works. But anyway, <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so twelve and a half minutes to get the almanac and the uh, ephemeris data from a satellite, and of course that continually updates itself um, regularly. So as your as your receiver on your phone or whatever is left on, it's constantly receiving this information. It keeps building a picture, mm -hmm. which also means that while it's on, if it misses something, it has to wait twelve and a half minutes to get it again, because of course it's all transmitted in sequence and it just takes yeah, time. Right. So. There's no big drama once you've got all of that information to sort of, I'll oh, give it a fudge, that's all right. Then next time around you'll fix it and then you'll get the updates. And, you know, so this is the other reason why um, you sort of, you know, you turn your device on you or whatever and you get a location which is down the street a bit and it'll like swing closer to you. Yeah. And that's because it's actually taking the information, it's refining it and mm -hmm. taking time and yeah. it sort of gets better and better and better. But there's more to it than that, um, and I highly recommend it. it's beyond the scope of us talking here. But if people are interested, there's some there's a really good uh, tutorial about how the entire system works, right down to the calculations on uh, Trimble's website. And Trimble's a GPS receiver manufacturer going back decades. They do boats and all sorts of fancy ones, and and high quality 
um, GPS receivers for surveyors. So they're down to like centimeter accuracy. Oh, wow. so, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they do it by uh, using this thing called differential GPS, which again, a little bit beyond the scope of here, but the idea is they're supplementing that GPS information with a local signal. So right. having a, a very well-known survey mark, for example, you set up some equipment yeah, right on that survey right. mark yeah. and you have a, a local, very, very detailed ability to get right down to sub-centimeter accuracy. So you, sometimes you'll see those guys that um, hang on, hang out on a construction site on the road yeah, and I have a very fancy looking pole with a wee keypad on it mm. with a little disc on the top. That's one of these very high definition GPS units and you'll see him moving his stake literally, you know, centimetre by centimetre just to get that exact spot. So yeah, okay. when they're building roads, they're actually really accurate about where they're placed, <laughs> if, you, if you didn't already know. So there you go. We'll put a link to that um, Trimble t- tutorial site on the show notes here because it's, it's actually worth having a look at if you're interested. Of course, um, GPS, Global Positioning System. It's all about position on the planet. There are lots and lots of purposes for GPS, and most people will know them. You know, you've got your your car navigation, geocaching, um, location of this location, uh, tracking of this, tracking your dog, tracking your kids. You know, tracking your phone, <laughs> tracking <laughs> your yeah, tracking your cat. No, yeah, true, true. Yeah, the people have done that. It's actually really fascinating <laughs> to see some of the maps <laughs> of what I've, cats I've do. seen that. Yeah, yeah, it's quite quite cool. So all of these things that you can do with GPS. Most of them are to do with position, but there's one of them that is not to do with position at all, which is great for IT people. And if people don't know about it, they should. And that is accurate time. Mm -hmm. Because your GPS receiver is taking signals from satellites that have atomic clocks and working out very precise time, you can use that to get incredibly precise time for your computer systems. So obviously you know, and some others might as well, is that the clock keeping chip on your computer is terribly inaccurate. Mm. So it's quite often used as a loader to load the time into your operating system and your CPU deals with it because it knows the frequency and fun, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But yeah. So with a GPS connected to your computer, you can get, you know, sub sort of, I think it's like microsecond timing accuracy, which is great. So yeah, I think the GPS time clocks, one of our customers sits at about 106 microseconds accuracy. Yeah. Exactly, and and the longer it sits there, the better the time gets. And uh, it's so <laughs> there's um, actually the accurate time uh, for the very old technology now. <laughs> it's not that old; it's only a few years old for CDMA. So yeah. people may have heard of CDMA. It's the one of the early technologies, or before. Actually, no, it's still being used, but it's called something else. You know, your three G and your four G and stuff are a WCDMA. You know, but the uh, the older version of CDMA that was used by uh, here in New Zealand by Telecom at the time and then whatever they turned into after that since they've had about five name changes <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> um, was the old um, CDMA network where you had a, a phone and you had to get the ID of the phone registered to your number. There was no SIM cards and things like that. Mm. But that technology for doing cellular phones, the, the, the cell sites had to have incredibly accurate timing for it to work. So they use yeah. these um, really cool, um, they're called rubidium oscillators. And the idea is that it's got a, a very accurate timing system, kind of like an atomic clock. It oscillates yeah. a, a... Dan. <laughs> <laughs> these sound on my computer as well. <laughs> All right. Oh, dear. So these uh, oscillators had a similar idea to an atomic clock. There's a There's a... A little crystal in there, rubidium crystal, that is oscillated with the right bit of electronic wizardry, as mm. as it works. And uh, they actually end up being quite expensive, but you can pick them up on eBay now quite cheap because all these sites have been turned off. And mm. you can actually use them to take a GPS signal in and get this oscillator going. And with the circuitry on the on the system, which reads from the GPS receiver, it adjusts the time, and you can get an incredibly accurate time out of these things, which is what we use for these cell, um, CDMA cell sites. Mm. Um, and at some point in the future, when we have a have an episode about uh, cellular technology, we can talk about how that worked. So, yeah, <laughs> and, what, and why they needed accurate time. So, time is one of those uh, uses that you wouldn't be expecting for um, for GPS. So there you go. Um, a couple of other things that you can do, you know, geofencing. You can set up a, a virtual fence around your house, and if devices cross that, they can you know, do something, or it can be an event driven thing, or Mm. Um, you can also use them for um, have 
uh, virtual fences or geofences around uh, points of interest. So a church or a cathedral or the town hall or things like that and carrying the right device, which is going, I've got all these geofences here. Oh, I've walked into it. I'll pop up some information for you or an application on your phone. Yeah. Like that. So hmm. yeah, it, there's, there's more to it than just getting a location. It's actually using the location saying, well, I'm here. So perhaps I can do something that's relevant to here. So technology people keep coming up with ideas all the time don't they so. yeah just think how revolutionary um turn by turn gps was oh man <laughs> <laughs> i remember getting one of the very early models and i think now if i tried to use that now i'd just scream in pain <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> terrible <laughs> interface though but no they were very clever um and the wonder you know when you went to go and use google maps oh wow it's got navigation into it and and your car and also yeah yeah turn by turn and knowing the roads and the turns and yeah, see how quickly Google Maps is updated for roads as well. So it's, mm. it's brilliant. I think that's a uh, a relatively high level sort of introduction to roughly how GPS works. So in summary, you've got some things spinning around in the sky and your phone, your device, whatever, knows where they are, can receive a signal from them and you can use that to calculate all of the maths required to say, I'm that far from that one, that far from that one, that far from that one. I'll piece it all together and say, I'm here. That's roughly how GPS works. <laughs> but I, yeah, highly recommend uh, going and having a look at the uh, G- Trimble GPS tutorial if you're interested and also the, the Wikipedia um, page on GPS is, as is always the case with Wikipedia, incredibly detailed and very technical for some of that stuff, but um, does explain it quite well as well. So I, I do confess most of my top up of my memory of how this works came from those sites. So <laughs> uh, well worth a look at if you want to learn more. So... I think that um, we've done pretty well there, Dan. I think we're at yeah. about, about 20 minutes, which is a, about our goal for these episodes. So, And again, folks, if you've got anything else that you're interested about, um, that we might be interested about, uh, we'll do the work to go and research for you and work out how something works and try and explain it to you in terms that might be a bit easier. And next time I'll try and talk a bit slower too because I know I ramble <laughs> on a bit. <laughs> it's all right. but, so until next time, well, do we know what we're going to do next time, Dan? Not yet. Not yet. Might might be power. Might be something else. Um, wi Fi, perhaps. Wi Fi, perhaps. Um, seeing as I probably need to be in the hot seat for the next one. <laughs> yeah. Well, perhaps by then you might fix your Wi Fi in your house so that I can actually connect to the right network and actually get some internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, possibly. Or maybe we should do power instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just in case the Wi Fi is not working. <laughs> okay, folks. Right. Until next time. Catch you later. See ya. That was Tech Explainers with Mike and Dan. If you have some tech you want explained, you can email us at contact at techexplainers.nz.